Um, we're very excited to have you all here today to talk all about connected recruiting. Get to the next slide. Just a few housekeeping items before we start. Today's session will be recorded and will be shared after the fact. Everyone's gonna be on mute for the duration of the session, but we do encourage you all to ask questions in the dedicated questions panel. That should be on the side of your screen and we'll aim to get to those at the end of the session with our panel of experts. Um, let's go to the next slide. So let's dive in. My name is Catherine Carangelo and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Bullhorn. I love today's topic because it really is a blend of marketing and recruiting, and I'm delighted to be joined by these four leaders, mm -hmm. Chris Wirt, David Cerns, Raymond Penny, and Jack Copeland, who mm -hmm. in our prep calls leading up to this had a whole host of ideas and discussions and content that we hope to kind of create after this session, but it's clear that they're passionate about this topic too. If you head to the next slide. Um, so where we're gonna start today's session is with a bit of an overview of the what, the why, and the how. What actually is connected recruiting? What does it look like in practice? Why are customers adopting this approach and what results are they seeing? How do they measure success? How do they put this into action? And we're gonna end with a bit of a discussion with our guest speakers to dig into that last piece a bit more because if you're anything like me, I love a good framework and I'm happy to talk about things in concept but the real life tangible examples are what brings it all to life and makes it stick. Let's go to the next slide. Before we get into the what, I think it's always good to level set on the current environment at the moment. We all know the last few years have brought on unprecedented change in every aspect of our lives, and the staffing and recruitment industry is no different. First, we saw this radical and quick shift to a digital first approach. With everyone having to work from home at a moment's notice, we were forced to transform the way we work, collaborate, onboard, you name it. And look at us now. I think for me personally, working from home is now the norm. And the people I'm looking to hire on our team are no longer constricted to just the greater Boston or greater London area. And while we forced this change uh, came on quick, many of us were lucky to adapt to this new way of work. And again, for many, I think it's safe to say that it's here to stay. Secondly, we're all well aware that no matter where you are in the world, the talent shortage is at an all time high. Everyone's hungry for top talent. And that seemed to be a quick shift too. One minute there was uncertainty and reluctancy to hire and the next it was go, go, go. And I know that we're not alone in that. And lastly, because of this absolute need for top talent, it's a candidate's market through and through. Not only do candidates hold the cards, but their expectations have shifted through this time as well. And what does that really mean? So what we mean by that is that during the pandemic, there are countless of people out of work, even at times starting to companies like Fiverr, Upwork, Uber, DoorDash, the list goes on. What those companies did was create this expectation that finding work on your terms that can cater to your lifestyle needed to be absolutely seamless. Firing an up and app to say, I'm available now, I'm ready to go is kind of the new norm. And today's talent and candidates are digital natives. And if it can't happen in a few clicks, it's seen as a burden. They crave this consumer-like experience we see in other facets of our daily lives, whether that's buying something on Amazon or getting an Uber to the airport. And what's more is that they expect it. So when it comes to finding a job, applying to a job, getting onboarded for a job, they want that frictionless experience too. Let's head to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And what's the data tell us? So about eight months ago, we surveyed your candidates and 90% of them said they wish the process to find a job was easier. 50% of them abandoned a job process halfway through because it took too long. And 93% said it was easier to work with these online staffing platforms. Now, with all that said, we also saw that majority of the people, the candidates surveyed, they still prefer to work with staffing firms. They want to work with an actual human that will be more consultative in the process. So, and that presents a challenge for all of us. How do we ultimately fulfill the digital seamless consumer-like experience today's top talent expect while still being highly personalized and human throughout? We had the next slide, put more simply, how do we deliver the right message at the right time at every single point of the talent life cycle? And that's what connected recruiting is all about. We can head to the, the next slide here. Connected recruiting is a methodology. It's a framework that we've established based on the real world challenges that our customers are faced with and how they're overcoming them. It's a collection of best practices that takes a note from digital marketers and digital marketing best practices and how they learn how to best engage with their audiences. And it's bigger than the technology we use. I think uh, we'd all love for us to you know, buy a piece of technology, flip a switch and every problem is solved. 
it's not how it works. Uh, you really need to understand how to leverage the technology to get to the right people based on the right signals. And you also need to understand the fundamentals on how to engage those people best. Get to the next one. Um, so at its core, this is how we define connected recruiting. It's a methodology that helps staffing firms think about the way they engage talent in today's world. These positive, seamless talent experiences are more important than ever before. And we need to all put on our marketing hats and think about the experience we're looking to deliver. Because when we do, we end up creating this consistently engaged talent pool that's sitting right in your database. And that ultimately results in a lower cost to acquire talent and these increased redeployment rates. Let's head to the next one. So current state, I know one size doesn't fit all, but in talking to a number of our customers, we learned that an awful lot of focus and attention goes into this attract phase. You attract people to your website, to your job postings, you pull them in through job advertisements, you stick them all in your database, and then you'll hopefully place a few. So this is essentially a numbers game. The more money and time and investment you spend on the job ads and that attract part up front, the more people you pull in, and then you'll get your placements. But what happens with all those people in the middle? They're stuck in your database. You paid for them. How do we do more with what's in there? And I think that's what connected recruiting is all about. It's instead of this linear, uh, we can head to the next one, actually. Instead of this linear and often stagnant workflow, we turn this into this cycle and we engage people throughout the entire journey. So let's walk through step by step. Uh, next slide, please. First, we attract people. As I mentioned before, I think that's where the bulk of staffing firms are spending their time. But when only a few candidates make it through to that interview, submission, and ultimately placement process, what do we do with the rest? That's where the engage step comes in. We need to engage them. We find out what their preferences are, their skill sets. We find out what other jobs they might be a fit for. We proactively suggest these other jobs based on what we've learned. And we keep that conversation going, even though they might not have been the perfect fit for the role that was top of mind with that initial search. Think of this as pipelining for the future. Next one. Uh, next, we onboard. When you have these engaged candidates and you found a suitable job match, you make the onboarding process as painless as possible. And we're not just talking about the lead up to the start date. You'll see here, we're talking about the onboarding phase going beyond that start date. Yes, that lead up is critical. You need to get the right documents. You need to be able to do that from any device. Uh, someone told me that I need to print something out. I think I'd have to legitimately think about whether or not it's worth it for me to move forward with whatever it is. Maybe that's dramatic, but I think we've all been conditioned to live this life of convenience at this point. Um, so when it comes to onboarding, as soon as that candidate's on the job, the onboarding process doesn't stop there. Staffing firms that adopt this connected recruiting approach are continuing to keep in touch. They send surveys. They see how the first day is going, the first week, the first few weeks, because when it comes time for them to come off assignment, it's a whole lot easier to tee up another role, especially when they've had such a positive experience working with you. It's easy, and that's what people are looking for, that convenience, that frictionless experience. Next up here, we have nurturing, which kind of completes the cycle. Think of nurturing as sort of an extension of that engage phase. Uh, say you have someone coming off an assignment and you don't have another role for them queued up at that moment, but you might in the near term. All the more reason to keep in touch, keep in communication so that you can learn more about their skills, the jobs they prefer, maybe they've acquired new skills. So then you have this go-to group of people that you've had success with in the past who can be teed up for that right job in the future. And what does that result in? If you head to the next one, you'll see the people that are flowing in through the funnel at the top are continuing to circulate throughout this whole cycle. And next, we see from a results perspective, really booming stats across the board. If you dig into each phase a bit deeper, there's a whole host of metrics that you can measure, monitor, and tweak over time to really move the needle in your business. Let's take Attract, for example. When you're attracting candidates, you might want to take a look at your speed to follow up to an application, reducing the time it takes to reach out to them, eliminating that black hole will almost certainly result in higher response rates. When you have higher response rates, you're more likely to engage these candidates for an existing job rec or maybe others that are a more suitable match to their skills. When it comes to onboarding, you'll see lower no-show rates, higher MPS rates, higher engagement. And lastly, with nurturing, you'll see higher redeployment rates, which ultimately reduces your talent acquisition costs and fundamentally shifts the proportions of where you source your talent from with an increase coming from your own database. Does that mean you can cut off all your job boards then? No, of course not. There's always gonna be a need to fill the top of the funnel, but this approach helps you maximize every dollar spent. And the customers who are adopting this approach 
they're tripling redeployment rates. They're getting upwards of 90% of their talent for their placements from their own database. And how do they do it? They baseline where they're at. They come up with a hypothesis of what might be able to move the needle. They test it, they measure it again, they optimize. It's all about tweaking what's in place. But what's great is that you don't have to start from scratch. There are countless examples, playbooks, templates of what to say and when. Um, and when we you know, introduce our experts in a second, we'll get a lot of examples there as well. So where does that leave us today? We talked about the what and the why. And as I said, I'd love to get into some concrete examples of how our customers and, and people in the industry are really leveraging this approach to, to see some outsized results of their companies. We head to the next one for a second. Um, I'm, as I mentioned before, thrilled to be joined by these leaders at a few of our top marketplace partners who are passionate about creating these incredible talent experiences. And they work with staffing firms day in and day out to do so, whether that's through the technology they're using or engagement strategies. They've seen that time and time again that adopting this connected recruiting approach can, can really make a significant impact. Um, and I'd love if we can have our panelists maybe turn their cameras on so we can have a bit of a conversation. And of course, I'm the one odd man out because being at home and working from home means my internet is not allowing my screen to work. So I'm, I'm on the phone here, but we'll still have a, a very, very good conversation. Um, and maybe just to start off, I'd love it if you can all introduce yourselves and, and the companies you represent. Maybe we'll start with Raymond if that, if that works. Surely. Um, my name is Raymond Penny. I'm founder CEO at Kylo Partners. And I guess I'm the old guy in the room. And for everyone on the call, it has always been like this. And it would be great if we can make connected recruiting work um, because databases have been there for a long time with candidates that uh, need what we're speaking about. Um, Kyle, I've got 70 people globally. Uh, we work exclusively with Bullhorn-owned products and we implement and customize those products as well as having our own document and data management tools on Bullhorn. I look forward to today's conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Raymond. Um, what about you, Chris? Yeah, hey, I'm Chris Word. I'm the Director of Sales for the Eastern U.S. and Latin America um, for Daxtra. And uh, I've been with Daxtra for a little over four years now, but I've been in the recruitment space for almost a decade. And um, really all that we do here, we're also a global company, um, 120 plus employees. And um, we're one of the original marketplace partners with Bullhorn. So had a, a very long and fruitful relationship together. And um, you know, all of our technology focuses on recruitment process automation and a large majority of this um, connected recruiting flywheel. So excited to dive in a little bit deeper. Awesome. Uh, next up, David. Hi, I'm uh, David Cerns, co-CEO with Haley Marketing. Um, we have been helping the staffing industry for the past 25 and a half years to find better ways to sell and recruit. Um, like Chris and Daxtra, we've been working with Bullhorn. I remember when Art was in a 10 by 10 booth at Staffing World. So a long history together. Um, and today we're really focused on helping our clients to find more efficient ways, probably at the beginning and the end of the flywheel on the attract, the better engage, and particularly the nurture. So looking forward to talking about that. Amazing. And last but certainly not least, Jack. Hi guys, thanks. Yeah, my name is Jack Copeland. I am CEO and co-founder here at Staffing Future. I've been in the industry um, getting on towards 18 years now um, with Staffing Future. I launched it about five years ago with my business partner and we build tech-enabled websites for staffing companies. So we focus exclusively on websites and job boards, integrating them into places like Bullhorn eRecruit, Bullhorn for Salesforce and the various other marketplace partners and building software that helps sort of attract, engage and, and nurture talent basically. And also very excited to be here. Awesome, well, thank you all. We're excited to have you. And just to, to kind of get in, I know covered a lot of kind of breeze through things in the beginning here and there's a lot to be kind of overwhelming. Uh, oftentimes I hear a question from folks that we're talking to about this and they wanna know, where do people even get started? Uh, how do they, do they have the right people on their teams? What do they think about first? It can be kind of overwhelming. So Chris, I think you had a really good analogy that I thought kind of put it in perspective. Maybe you can share that. Yeah, so I always, always tell my, my clients that you really have to treat your tech stack like you're building a house. You know, there's, there's certain things that you, you have to, to do to you know, ensure success in the connected recruitment cycle. And, and really the number one 
is having clean and, and quality data. Um, you know, I always say you wouldn't put heating or, or air conditioning in a house with no walls. Um, so you've really got to make sure that your house is in order before you start adding additional features. And, you know, what's also important in, in that process is making sure that you're putting automated processes in place to make sure that you're keeping that data clean and rich in content moving forward. Awesome. And Raymond, I know that uh, data is near and dear to your heart. How, how do you, what advice do you give to people to get started with this process? Um, there's a really simple one, which is add yourself to your own database and experience <laughs> what it's like to be in your database or be attracted by you and then follow it through. And if that process isn't good for you, then it's, it's unlikely to be good for the people you're trying to attract. And you may find that the, the data you've got or the, the way your things are configured maybe need a little changes to make it work better. But if, if you start slowly and incrementally get better, then it's a fantastic way to, to start the wheel and then maybe even accelerate the wheel. Totally. And David, you, you actually made a comment when we were talking about this earlier too, um, like thinking about all those different four phases where do you get started? How do you isolate where you need to kind of pay most attention to? Yeah, for me, it's about process mapping and really looking at what you're doing. I want to kind of build on what Raymond says. I love the idea of putting yourself through your own service experience to see what it feels like. Um, I remember sitting down with one of our clients at a, at a national meeting and they handed me a marker and a flip chart. And I said, let's document what it's like to be a candidate trying to get a job in your organization. And as they're shouting out the steps in the process and I'm writing things down and I'm turning pages and I'm turning pages and the people in the room are starting to laugh. And so finally someone says, this isn't funny. This is what we make a light industrial candidate go through to get a job, this is insane. And so I think everyone needs to look at what's in the process because if you're going to have a connected recruiter and you're gonna have candidates that are truly engaged and retained and redeployed, then you wanna look at how you can make that process easier, faster, simply sometimes just more fun. And how can you make it more engaging at every step? Um, and the process of mapping it usually will point out your biggest gaps and where you can get the quickest wins. Totally. And, and Jack, I think when we were talking about where to start to, I think mapping the process and having the data in place is really important, but you also made a comment that I thought was interesting about getting that buy-in from your management team. Can you speak more to that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it depends on the type of business and where you're at in your journey. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as a starting company where you've got 10 users, 500 users, what the long term, short term uh, goals are, I think having some sort of short, medium and long term plan is important. But especially for some of the sort of medium sized staffing companies, if, if, if this is feeling overwhelming, if it's something that's new to you, maybe starting with some elements of low hanging fruit starting with some elements of just keeping one or two products that you can introduce from a software point of view, one or two methodologies that you can see some success behind and you can get some momentum behind, can really help get buy-in from the recruitment and the sales divisions, which is only going to help you as you add to that stack and implement. And so I, I definitely agree with the guys. You want a long-term plan. You want to start the absolute backbone of the organization uh, with the data and building up. But I also know that that can be quite a lot of upheaval for some organizations. And sometimes there are one or two pieces of low hanging fruit where you can go and get some quick wins and you can just start to get that buy and momentum um, and take it from there. Awesome. So let's, let's dig in. I think let's go phase by phase and really dig into some of these tangible examples that, you know, our audience can kind of walk away with and start thinking about, you know, how could they apply that to their workflows and their processes. So starting at the beginning with attract, as we said up front, you know, people are spending a lot of time on this now, David, what do you think that people can do to tweak how they're approaching their workflows in that track phase? And what have you seen to be truly game-changing? So I would say the best thing that people can do is to go further upstream in the process. Usually at Attract, we're thinking about job advertising. And I'm already trying to go after people who are active job seekers, but that's just a small portion of the total marketplace. And something like four out of five candidates don't even think about staffing companies. So if I wanna really maximize my reach in the attract phase, I gotta think upstream. What are people who are looking for thinking about? What are people who are passive job seekers? They're not looking for, what are they thinking about? What is the intent when they go online and when they think about their career? And from that intent, I can think about the kinds of information that would engage those people, that I could create a blog post that's gonna get found because that's what they're searching for, that I can create social content that's gonna resonate with people 
In the attract phase, I'm thinking about jobs. I'm thinking about career, career advice, but I'm thinking about more. I'm thinking about really knowing my candidates, who they are, what they care about, what interests them, what's going on in their industry, and then how I will share content that they will then consume. You know, it's a perfect example. We were working with a company in the Bay Area in California. Uh, they recruited for software engineers. And this was several years ago. They wrote one blog post, how to become an automation engineer. That one blog post caught fire. And for three years, that single post was the number one driver of traffic to their website because it was on a topic that mattered to their audience. And the other side to the attract is thinking about the conversion path. Uh, when someone hits your website, what happens? They're not always going to apply to a job right away. And we have to think about all the ways we can engage someone so we get the opportunity to start to build the relationship. Awesome. And what do you mean by that? So if they're not applying to a job, how do you capture that interest? What do you think, what do you think people should be doing there? So great question, Catherine. And, and we found an interesting stat years ago. We, we looked at job seeker behavior and we found that a candidate who comes back to your website a second time is actually twice as likely to apply to a job. But I need to know who to follow up with. So can I offer them a job alert instead of a job? Can I offer them content? Can I offer them something that allows me to capture some contact information so that I can continue to nurture the relationship so that I can use automation to follow up so that I can script the process of getting them to know my company, getting them to know the connected recruiter with whom they're going to be working. Awesome. Yeah, those are great, super concrete examples. I think that how-to content, that's always ranking highest on Google, right? So if you're thinking about producing it, that's what's going to draw people to your website first and foremost, or that kind of glossary content. What is this? Like, what is an automation engineer, for example? Um, those, those always seem to do well from a Google perspective, for sure. Yeah, and anybody gives any, any content that tells people how to take shortcuts, they love that. Oh, yes. People love a shortcut, uh, me included. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thank you for that. Chris, I think you, were also had, you also had some interesting examples around chatbots and how that can be applied during that, that initial attract phase. Yeah, I mean, all in all, I, I totally agree with what David said. I mean, I've got essentially three elements that that I feel are are kind of a must in that attract portion of the flywheel. And and uh, just as an aside, I, I worked for a, a job board in the hourly market for about four years. And one of the things that we focused on very heavily was, you know, how do we get people to convert into an application, right? Um, especially in the hourly market, you know, eight to ten years ago, um, you know, any additional data that they had to fill in was um, you know increasing that drop off rate significantly so what we what we found is that every additional data table that had to be filled out in order for an application to be completed each data table resulted in a double digit increase in drop off percentage so um, you know kind of my three elements that that I, I you know tell my my customers about is making it easy for the candidate you're attracting to find the jobs that are a good fit right if they make it there they're not sure what jobs that they're going to you know, maybe be a good fit for today or in the future, you've got to put systems in place that that advertise those jobs that are a good fit for those people. And then once they identify the job that they feel is the best fit, you've got to make it as easy, easy as possible for them to submit their resume to that job. And a lot of times what we see is, is putting that, um, you know, in an action item up front to say, hey, submit your resume, and then using a chat bot or using bullhorn automation or, or messaging um, to gather that additional, you know, validation criteria or qualification criteria after you've already gotten that resume or you've gotten their contact information. Um, and then, you know, utilizing those tools, um, you know, even, even uh, you know, post, post resume submittal or post qualification questions to, as David mentioned, serve up additional, additional good fit positions for them if they haven't uh, you know, scheduled an interview in 24, 48 hours. Maybe you send an, an automated email with three more jobs that would be a good fit for that candidate. Um, so it's all about making sure that you're making it as easy as possible for them to find the best job for them today and as easy as possible for them to, to convert into an applicant and, um, and have an opportunity to interview. Awesome. I love that. So it's all about kind of maximizing each candidate that comes through, but also, as you said, making that as seamless as possible. Maybe yep. you start with the most essential information you need so you can get back in touch with them, but you use these other technologies and tools to, to get more of that info as you continue that relationship. And I think as they, it's all about trust too, right? As they trust you more, someone that they're working with, 
they're more willing to provide more of that information and you don't have those roadblocks. Yeah. And That's we've even seen, you know, with, um, you don't even have to get rid of your data tables, right? We've seen with, with customers, they've increased their, their click through rates by over 400% just by implementing parsing technology that form fills all of those fields for the candidate, gives them an opportunity to maybe build a profile and become part of that talent community. Um, so there's, there's, there's plenty of ways to skin the cat in this, in, this, uh, in this attract phase, but the importance is making sure that they're not having to manually enter data and go through a bunch of, of hoops in order to become a, a converted applicant. Awesome. And Jack, you said something interesting too about you know, leveraging the recruiters on your team as a mechanism to kind of expand that brand message. So, you know, David talked a lot about the importance of content and branding and how do you draw people to you? And I feel like you had an interesting point of view on how to get that message out there. Well, yeah, absolutely. So I think, I think part of the challenge is, is that a lot of companies don't necessarily have the right marketing operational systems in place. And, and then they put that in, but they kind of forget how the recruiters become part of that. And so your recruiters and your salespeople, you know, they're very well connected on LinkedIn. They're having a lot of conversations. We still find that when we look at the sources, often referral is one of the number one sources in people's databases, you know, globally of candidates. And so if you can find a way to make um, a consistent and coherent marketing attraction message, not just for your brand within your business, but if you can also mobilize your recruiters, make sure that they're educated on that message, make sure that they have the right technology to enhance the distribution of your jobs on like a more individual level and to engage with your recruiters and be consistent with your wider sort of attract piece, then that will, that will be incredibly efficient. Um, and it definitely sort of ties back into what everyone else was talking about with, with conversion, right? Making it sort of easy to do what, what you want someone to do. Like perhaps that even is as simple as in, in certain markets where candidates are very hard to attract, taking them through a basic qualification and then getting them straight on the phone via like meeting booking software or a chat bot with the right kind of person. In that scenario, so much of the actual um, attract messages coming from the recruiter themselves certainly is without bound phone calls as well. And I think sometimes that gets a little bit forgotten about. So you can use technology and you can use training to make that part and parcel of, of what you're doing. Amazing. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's dig into engage next, the next phase. You've spend all this time attracting these folks to your brand, creating this awesome content to, to pull them in. Now that you have them, and maybe they weren't a fit for that initial search or that initial job you had in mind, how do you keep them engaged? Raymond, I know we were talking about this a lot. What, what have you seen customers deploy that, that really works best here? I think that uh, once you're on the database and the candidate's there, you need to personalize it as much as you possibly can. Uh, simple things like making sure you, if someone's known as Raymond, don't mistakenly call them Ray. And if you've got information about the, the types of jobs they've applied for and how much they want to be paid, make sure that you give them, send them a good match as part of that engage process. There's uh, people, people want to think that they, you've listened and then you've responded and then you're showing them something that's been um, uh, segmented just for them. And I think a, a really successful segmentation and as we get to the in continual engagement is based upon being accurate in, in how you engage with them. A, a great example we've seen with, with customers is that uh, if, a, if a candidate's applied for a job and let's say they've been successful in the job, you know that uh, the skills they've used in that job, the rate they've been paid, and where they were working. So you now know much more information. Make sure you've updated it. And the, when you're trying to re-engage with them, you can be really personal and say, hey, we know you've got these skills. We know you've worked for this rate. Would you like to um, engage again? Totally. And that's where the quality and the cleanliness of your data is so critical, right? Like you need to have that at all times. Otherwise, you're probably sending out all these communications and then they'll look really unpersonalized and doesn't really give the person much incentive to kind of continue working with you. Absolutely. I think the more automated you can make that or the, may, the more that it can be normal to update the data, whether that's being done in the background through some logic or whether it's being done by the consultant, if the consultant understands how important it is, that engage things even, even more powerful. Totally. And 
the data is also super important, right? Because you need it to in order in order to kind of segment your database, right? From a marketing perspective, we always talk about who are you targeting, who's your target audience, how do you put those people into similar streams so they're getting relevant content. And Jack, I know you were talking a lot about kind of segmentations and how you split up those different audiences. Can you maybe speak to more of that? Because I think that's a really important part of this engage phase as well. Yeah, absolutely. So mainly where we've got involved with it is sort of more in the marketing phase. So we were very involved with bullhorn automation, um, you know, back in its early days when it was called Herefish a few weeks ago. Um, and, um, and, and, and obviously it's been a great tool in terms of workflow automation as well. But we found that a lot of our clients were able to use it as a sort of top of the funnel or maybe medium level of the funnel because they already are in your ATS nurturing um, sort of system. So th there's a lot of ways that you can define who you're reaching out to and where they're at in the process, right? Are they clicking links? Are they responding to emails? Have you spoken to them? And so to Raymond's point, right, the more sophisticated you can get about the individual and who you're talking to is very, very important. And that's going to be very data driven in terms of what you know about them. But you can also use it to be sophisticated about how engaged they are and where they are in their journey. Someone who was in your database three years ago that obviously went and found another job and you don't know what that job is and it was direct placement and probably isn't looking right now and that's all you've got needs to be treated very, very differently to someone that you've been talking to for the last sort of 60 days or the last 30 days. And so that there's a lot of different triggers that you can leverage from engagement scores, the way that we're interacting, the different pieces that you've got to try and determine how am I going to approach them with that content? How am I going to approach them with that engagement? And then reactionary from that, if you are marketing to them, if you are sending those emails, if they're clicking them, if they're, if they're looking at them or engaging them with them, they're far more likely to fill out surveys, engage with chatbot experiences, they can go onto your recruiter's call list, it can all become part of your sort of holistic experience of how I'm reaching out to these people. Well, people who aren't, perhaps we want to be in a position where we don't bombard them, we don't lead them to unsubscribe, we want to build that sort of subconscious message about who we are and what we do and try and add value to them and sort of softly, softly wait until perhaps they're back in like a, a buying experience. You know, that's, that's more of a direct placement example, but I think really thinking about the way that we're approaching people in, in different stages of the way that they would apply to a job, talk to a recruiter or where they are in engaging with staffing companies is just as important as, as sort of segmenting the data to make sure it's relevant to them in terms of what they do. Do you feel like most people are creating those segments based on like the recency of what they've engaged with? Like you gave that example of like maybe they've interacted with you six months ago or three years ago, or I guess what are the common segmentations you see customers putting in place? Yeah, I mean, the, the main stuff that, that we see it can be a little bit too user driven sometimes. And so, you know, what I really like is the ongoing sort of nurturing side mm -hmm. of it where you go, okay, well, look, well, if someone hits 90 days, and they meet this requirement and they've never, you know, they've made it past first interview, they've had a conversation, they're in our top 8%, then this is the way that we approach it. Whereas if there's someone who's in a completely different bucket, then this is the way that we approach it. And it, it can be used in a lot of different elements because you can use it literally for people that are in the database, but you can even use it for people that aren't. And so one of the things that we did with a customer is, is they would find the challenge of maybe having to deploy literally 500 people in a couple of weeks that did the mm. same thing on the same site. And so they would build a landing page, they would run very, very targeted pay-per-click campaigns um, that would go directly into an application it'd be a form submission that went straight into a tear sheet and bullhorn, went through an automated bullhorn automation qualification workflow. Obviously within that, you've got drop off at every area. And then those that didn't make it through would go into nurturing patterns. And then the minute they had those kind of same assignments years later, they had that preset data to sort of pick up again. And so it, it can be done within sort of smaller segmentations as well as part of your wider onboarding sort of workflow automation piece, if that makes sure. sense. Sure. Yeah, totally. And speaking of onboarding, I think that's that's our next phase here, right? I mean, put simply, you have to nail this. You have a captive audience. You have the right person. You can't trip the finish line. Um, Raymond, maybe I know you were speaking when we were kind of prepping for this kind of about that onboarding process, what you've seen customers do to make that really, really painless and efficient. Uh, absolutely. You've got to think like the candidate and you've got to think where they might be and you've got to think what tools they might have and what you're asking for. So don't be going and asking someone in healthcare to do something that they need to be at a PC for. Make the most of 
photos rather than uh, images or make sure that things are done through web pages that will work really well on mobile and that the, the experience is straightforward. If I have to go home and scan and upload, then I'm less likely to, uh, to apply or I'm going to forget. Equally, if you can make, make the most out of lots, everybody's, how many people would pick up the phone straight away if one of the red lights came on or there was a notification came down? So can you make the most of the nudges and reminders that you use with people to help them through that onboarding process and make sure that maybe you're, you're communicating with them the right way? Email may be great for some, SMS might be others, it might be WhatsApp, but the, the, the best method and uh, maybe something one more thing, which is maybe slightly down the line, once you have someone through onboarding and they have things that are maybe about to run out, if you remind them early that maybe their license is about to expire and you'd like to get a new one, it's much easier to do that 30 days ahead of time than five minutes before you need it. So I would say they would be key points around onboarding for me. Definitely. Yeah. All, all super insightful. And David, I think you were talking too about, you know, we think of onboarding as like HR administration, providing job information. What are some of the examples that you've seen that customers are deploying in terms of the content that they can share around like setting expectations for their, for their position or whatever it might be? Well, um, Catherine, I think you, you actually just sort of know what the way we think about it is, you know, onboarding isn't a chance for you to set expectations with the temporary worker that you're going to be placing or the direct hire candidate you're going to be sending out. But it's also the transition to you, the first impression you're making with your client. And so what we want to be doing is thinking about in the workflow, how do I make sure that there's complete information provided to the candidate? So, you know, for example, um, I was at a, an executive forum several years ago, and there was a panel with uh, two individuals who, let's put this nicely, didn't like the staffing industry and didn't like the staffing industry a lot. <laughs> and they were there in front of a room full of the staffing executives. I gave them credit, but one of the individuals, he had a very personal story. He had seen a tragic accident happen because an employee was asked to do something he should never been asked to do and someone died. Now, in this case, what he said is he was blaming the entire staffing industry. He said, you know, when a, the problem happens, there's no one we can call. And the onboarding is setting the expectations of how do you communicate between the recruiter, the candidate, and the candidate back when something happens at the employer site and setting the, the tone for how you want the relationship to work, how you want the candidate to show up. Um, another example is in the world of healthcare. We're sending nurses, travel nurses, going a long way away to clients we may have never visited. So how are we working to make sure every detail is done right for the nurse, not just the facility they're gonna work at, but the housing and the transportation, everything else that they have to deal with. We want to be thinking about that onboarding process as the entire experience of the candidate and the employers when the candidate shows up. Totally, so it's nailing all those little details, but also making sure each party knows how to get in touch with you to ensure that everyone's having this good experience because it doesn't, doesn't end there. And I think as we go into nurture too, right? If they have a positive experience with that placement and, and you working with you in a consultative way, you're much more likely to be able to place them again. So, and, and sort of building on what Raymond said, you know, it's also about knowing what channels they're going to want to communicate with you through. And some right. are going to be email, some are never going to see their email. I like Raymond that you said WhatsApp because I'm a member of entrepreneurs organization and they do everything on WhatsApp and I wasn't a WhatsApp user. And now my phone goes off 700 times a day with WhatsApp <laughs> messages and I live there. So it's about knowing what your candidate's going to use. Totally. And diving into our last phase here, nurture, um, you know, I think a lot of people often overlook this and it might be one of the most critical turning points in this whole cycle to keep it going, right? You've just placed this person Hopefully they had a good experience. Of course, you can send surveys to, to verify that and see how you can tweak it moving forward. But how do you keep that connection going? It's kind of, as I said before, this extension of that engage phase. Um, David, I might stick with you for a second because you were talking a lot about nurturing and content and how Haley Marketing kind of helps customers play a role in that. Yeah, and it's the first thing I'd say is it's not just about jobs and careers. Sure, that's why the candidate's coming to you. That's the value you're giving to them as a paycheck. It's a career, the next step in their career. But in terms of nurturing, they're people. They're not placed candidates, they're individuals. They have interests, they have wants, they have needs. 
So how am I providing the content that they're going to find relevant? Sometimes it's going to be that exact match or what Chris said, that exact match job that they're going to be looking for next. But sometimes I don't want them to take the next job, especially if it's a direct hire candidate I just placed. So I want them to be thinking about how to how we can work with them long-term. I want to be thinking about developing career-long relationships. And if I'm a connected recruiter, I'm going to be thinking about how do I help people develop deeper knowledge in their career, develop deeper knowledge of how we work together in the future. And then I'm using the appropriate channels, automation, in-app messaging, uh, texting, to share that content with them. I'm thinking also about how do I continuously get feedback from the people that I've placed so that I know they had a good experience so that I know that it's time to think about redeployment so that I can proactively ask for referrals. So I'm maximizing the value to both parties of the relationship. Totally. And Chris, you had an interesting kind of more like technology slant on this. Like how do you keep that nurture process going? Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of it goes back to some of what, you know, Art was saying at, <clears throat> at Engage with, you know, treating your database like a talent community. Um, you know, you've got you've to implement more effective and efficient search capabilities and automated matching capabilities so that you can make sure that you're leveraging all of the, all of the candidates in your database at all times. Um, you know, we talk a lot about data hoarding and, and stale data. Um, you can use technology to make sure that your, your database is being refreshed with the most up-to-date information as you're coming across candidates, again, that already exist in your database, but now they're out on a different job board and they've updated their profile. Um, you know, we find across the industry only 15% only of job board views actually convert into a candidate profile in the, in the database the first time that they're, that they're viewed. Um, so implementing, you know, technology to integrate those external job board solutions into, you know, one central source of truth, which in this case being Bullhorn, um, is going to help you to not only build a bigger talent community and, and, you know, get more return on your investment from your, from your external job board sources, but then also um, kind of combining that with Bullhorn automation and Bullhorn messaging and, and using these advanced matching capabilities to, you know, serve up the right jobs to the people at the right time and make sure that they're being engaged with constantly. Um, you know, we know recruiters are working on countless number of recs at all times. And, you know, in some cases, the database might have 10,000 candidates or 10 million candidates. And it's, it's impossible to, to task a recruiter with going in and, and finding that, you know, purple squirrel or, or, or needle in a haystack. Um, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with that amount of data. So we've got to lean on automation. We've got to lean on technology a little bit more to, to really get the recruiters to a point where they can do what they are best at, which is building those relationships with the candidates and, you know, coaching them on, on, um, you know, whether or not this is a good fit for them and, and selling, you know, selling them to the, to the, to the job. Um, and I think, you know, that also, um, kind of leads into again the the, the chat bot and and you know that bullhorn automation piece having sequences and workflows that um, you can set up for those candidates from the internal database you know not just to leverage um, job openings and jobs that are a good fit for them today but also inviting them to events um, you know it was harder to do during COVID but now that we're all kind of you know back out in the world again. Um, you know, setting up an event for all of the developers in Richmond, Virginia to go to Top Golf, and just having a fun, uh, a fun experience and showing them that, um, you know, they can be part of your talent community, part of your part of your family as a as a staffing agency, and they're not just another resume in the database. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I meant to say that in the beginning. So thanks for reminding me. I, I loved what Art said at Engage about it's not a database, it's a community that you have to constantly engage and stay in touch with. And that's, you know, I mean, that's your network. So I love kind of ending on that. And before we wrap, I know we're at time, we could talk about this for hours and we probably will for the next several months. Um, but three things uh, I want to leave everyone with. One, just a big thank you to our presenters. Um, you guys were awesome. And I'm excited to, to kind of continue these conversations in further content pieces and webinars and the like. The second is an ask. I'd ask everyone that's on the call here, if you can kind of put into the chat, 
which which of these phases are you looking for most the most help with? That's going to help us kind of create more content as a follow on. We do want to do more webinars going deeper into each of these phases. But if you have thoughts or questions on how to do things at the attract, engage, onboard, nurture phase, I'd love to hear it. Um, and last but not least, if you're looking for more examples, here's a, a couple things that you can you can do to, to take a look at those. One, we will be publishing a blog with a lot of the comments that we had in this, this webinar and, and additional ones from our pre presenters. So we'll share that out shortly. Um, and the second one is our connected recruiting site. So if you head to bullhorn.com slash connected dash recruiting. Oh, thank you, Hannah, for putting that in there. Um, you can scroll down and see a whole library of these automation examples that uh, we've kind of put forward as best practices. We've collected from our customers based on ones that they've suggested that, that work really well. And we're going to be building this library over time. So we're constantly adding to it. So, so definitely check that out and share that with your teams. Um, so thank you again to everyone for joining on the phone. Thank you to our presenters for all these incredible insights. And we hope to see you at another session soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.